John Bartlow Martin was a master storyteller. His coverage of people suffering from poverty, racism, and mental illness drew national attention to problems in American society. His work was published in major magazines such as Harper's, The Saturday Evening Post, Life, Look, and Esquire. His powerful stories prompted policy changes and inspired other journalists to make a difference with their own reporting. Martin's career was varied. He wrote speeches for candidates like Robert Kennedy, Hubert Humphrey, George McGovern, and Adlai Stevenson. He worked with then-FCC Commissioner Newton Minow on the famous Fast Wasteland speech. He also worked on the presidential campaign of John F. Kennedy, who appointed him U.S. Ambassador to the Dominican Republic in 1962. He witnessed the first democratic elections there after decades of dictatorship. Martin was born in 1915 in Hamilton, Ohio, but moved to Indianapolis with his parents four years later. In his autobiography, he described his childhood as unhappy and marked by poverty brought on by the Great Depression. Those experiences developed his sympathy for society's downtrodden. He earned his degree from DePaul University in 1935 while working for the Indianapolis Times newspaper. He moved to Chicago with the proceeds from his first freelance article and launched his career in earnest. Martin established himself in the journalism world with a 1948 Harper's article about a mine explosion in Centralia, Illinois, which killed a hundred people. The article was more than 18,000 words long, the longest Harper's had ever published. It helped lead to changes in federal mine safety rules. Martin was the author of 15 books, including a two-volume biography of Adlai Stevenson, A History of Indiana, and a book about American policy in the Caribbean. Martin taught for 10 years at Medill, teaching and inspiring students. He died in 1987, and Medill established the John Bartlow Martin Award the following year to honor his work and his passion for the power of journalism to improve society. Good evening. I'm Charles Whitaker, Dean of the Medill School, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 presentation of the John Bartlow Martin Award. The Bartlow Martin Award is one of Medill's highest honors. It's our way of recognizing compelling journalism that raises awareness of issues that are or should be of tremendous public concern. The award, as the previous video uh, indicated is named for our distinguished uh, journalist and longtime faculty member who happened to have had the great honor of having as a magazine writing instructor when I was an undergraduate here at Medill many, many, many years ago. What John Bartlow Martin impressed upon me and all of his charges was the importance of journalism that illuminates the human condition, particularly the pain and suffering of the disenfranchised and dispossessed. He encouraged us to not merely write about politics and policies, but to write about the effects that those policies had on people whose voices were rarely heard in the national discourse. We're pleased to present this year's John Bartlow Martin Award to Michael Barajas and Sophie Novak, whose piece, Locked Up and Left to Die, which appeared in the Texas Observer, is a searing account of the preventable, preventable deaths in Texas jails. Michael and Sophie chronicle in gripping detail the widespread neglect and abuse that led to more than 1,000 deaths of people held in Texas jails, many of them while awaiting trial. It's an incredibly gripping story, wonderfully written and reported. Congratulations, Michael and Sophie. Your work is clearly in the spirit of John Bartlow Martin. Here to discuss the making of that story, among other things, is my colleague, Professor Patty Walter, who directs the judging of the John Bartlow Martin Award. Patty, who like me is a Medill alumna, holds the Helen Gurley Brown Magazine Chair. She's also a Charles Deering McCormick Distinguished Clinical Professor and teaches a variety of undergraduate and graduate courses across the Medill curriculum. Professor Walter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles, and welcome to everybody. Before we get to meet Michael and Sophie, I'd like to just acknowledge a few more people who help us with the John Bartlett Martin Awards. First of all, we have two honorable mentions this year. I'd like to acknowledge Ashley Powers for the story, The Redemption of Muhammad Khalid, which ran in the Washington Post. And our second honorable mention went to Mae Jung for the story, In the Cut, The United Nations' Own Humanitarian Crisis. I'd also like to 
um, give a big shout out to our Blue Ribbon judges who decided our three finalists. They are Sarah Austin, a 1998 alum and now executive editor at Elle Magazine, Caitlin Jacola, a 2013 alum, managing editor for The Trace, and Robert Samuels, a 2006 alum who's a nat the national political enterprise reporter at The Washington Post. I'd also like to thank the magazine and investigative journalism faculty who did our first crucial round of screening, Professors Doug Foster, Maylene Hopgood, Louise Kiernan, Alex Kotlowitz, Karen Springen, and Peter Slevin. And finally, uh, last but not least, I'd really like to thank the Martin family whose continued support of this award and involvement in Mandel means the world to us, being able to not just have an awards contest like this, but have um, actual monetary um, funds to reward this kind of journalism is increasingly important in this world. It's no small feat running a contest. We are annually humbled by the amazing stories that make their way to our inboxes and the size and caliber of the competition that brings us naturally, of course, to this story that Charles Whitaker just mentioned. Um, our, our winner. So Michael Brajas is the managing editor and founding editor of Bolts, a digital nonprofit magazine that covers power and political change. He has worked for years as a writer and editor specializing in criminal punishment, mass incarceration, and voting rights. And his partner on the story, Sophie Novak, is a freelance journalist mostly focused on long-form narrative and investigative stories about healthcare access, access and reproductive health care. She's been especially busy lately. Thank you for joining us. Um, and she was previously a reporter and editor of the Texas Observer Magazine. Before that, she covered healthcare for National Journal in Washington, DC. So welcome, Michael and Sophie. Wonderful. So our uh, first question is an easy one, but I think it's really important because I like to acknowledge that the community we built here is a journalism school. And by our very nature, we want to help people um, learn about and anticipate and inspire, be inspired for their own career paths. So I, as much as I read your bios, I think it's much more interesting for our students to hear from you about what you did to create a career in social justice reporting. So who want, let me. I'm looking at my screen. Sophie, why don't you go first and then Michael. <laughs> um, hi, all. Thanks so much uh, for the honor and for having us today. Um, gosh, well, I think I got into journalism because I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a million different things. And this was a way to kind of get to ask questions and learn about a lot of stuff professionally. <laughs> Um, I actually guess I had a little bit of an unusual trajectory in that I started at a national publication and then I went um, to a more local state level publication. And I think that's kind of tied to your question, Patty. My kind of motivation there was that I wanted to work somewhere where I could do reporting that felt kind of more connected to the communities that I was covering. I wanted to do more kind of on the ground um, coverage and really being out talking about folks and finding stories that weren't necessarily making their way to to where I was in DC. Um, and so I actually started following um, what was Texas's sweeping anti-abortion law years ago now uh, from afar and ended up deciding that I wanted to move here and cover that. Um, and so I think, you know, what it looks different for everyone, but I think finding a way to um, you know, finding a place that I guess you have the space to, um, you know, learn to write those kinds of stories. Sometimes that is kind of in a smaller outlet and a more local outlet to start to get to kind of flex those muscles and, and kind of learn as you go. Um, that's been my experience. Um, so yeah, my start in journalism. Um, I guess I, I kind of started um started writing stories uh mostly to get like free music and to go to shows for free like writing writing for all weeklies and blogs when i was in like high school and college um my trajectory sort of through newsrooms has been um yeah through mostly local local publications um uh daily a daily beat reporter um, also working for alt weeklies when more of those existed and have more resources um and then eventually yeah the texas observer that was a magazine and that was the first magazine that i worked for um as far as sort of the issues that i think uh i've ended up gravitating toward um and, and, and incarceration mass incarceration being one of them um, um that the story obviously touches on uh 
yeah, kind of, I think my interest in a lot of those started as a early reporter, an early beat reporter. I think this is still the case that it, local newsrooms and newspapers really still exist. A lot of young reporters are sort of thrown at uh, cops and courts. Um, and yeah, I ended up reporting on police, uh, trials, courts, um, and other things related to that that I think sort of ended up um, uh, opening my eyes to a lot of the struggles in this sort of in the current system and uh, yeah eventually sort of focused a lot of my reporting on that so uh, the story is about jails but I've been writing about jails in Texas for for more than a decade in different ways and I think that work has sort of built up over over time as I started seeing a lot of the same things over and over again it's a good segue to the specifics on this story. It's uh, Dean Whitaker already gave a, a lovely summary of it, but it's there's astonishing numbers all the way through the story. The number of people who've died, the number of records you all read, and I uh, really love it when students get to hear the sort of the background stats of a story. I don't know if you counted how many sources you talked to, but I'd love like how long did this take to report? Um, if you know how many people you talked to, pages you looked through. Just sort of give give people a sense of you know the whole iceberg, not just the tip that the, that we see um, when it gets published. Um, Sophie, you want to take you want me to take that first? <laughs> sure, I can take that first. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. So the process. I mean, it took a lot of time, um, as you sort of mentioned. There's a lot of this is like a very records intensive story. Um, the sort of cornerstone of it were these um, Texas Rangers reports. They were reports into investigations into jail deaths that um, um, is a function of a reform that we wrote about the Sandra Bland Act, which just basically made, among other things, made the state um, or made, made sheriffs in the state um, have to commission an outside investigation whenever something, uh, whenever a tragedy happens inside one of these facilities. And so, yeah, we went through, it took us a long time to get those records. Um, that's not in the story, uh, but yeah, we just had to fight for, for, for months um, to get the state police agency to turn them over to us. Uh, um, and then it was months of um, actually going through those records and sort of tabulating them and um, sort of the, the finished numbers that you see in the story were basically months of Sophie and I going through these reports um figuring out at first how exactly like what we wanted to track and how we wanted to track it and then making sure we were sort of consistently doing that over time um some of these reports ranged from hundreds of pages to just a couple there's a big variation but on a whole i mean we read through thousands of pages of documents um to ultimately get um a spreadsheet um a data set essentially of um of, of what was happening, something that we could look at more holistically. So um, yeah, that's just on the record side. I mean, there's honestly, we, we, we could, there's a, that was just one element of the record, even though that was sort of the cornerstone of the story and why we did it. There were a bunch of records that we ended up getting from the state jail commission that they eventually had to turn over, databases that they gave us, they keep internally, um, uh, court records, you know, in the individual counties and places where we went. Um, so really, I mean, hundreds more pages of records sort of on top of that. Um, so having two reporters on this was so crucial because I don't, I don't, I think it would have taken so much longer for either one of us to do this independently. So um, I'll stop there and let Sophie kind of give into maybe more of the human sources. Yeah, I can fill in a little bit. Um, I guess I'll, I'll also kind of caveat all that by saying we got to this story uh, idea in the first place because of a whole bunch of reporting that Mike had done beforehand, right? Years and years of reporting and, and other folks. I mean, lots of outlets kind of reporting on individual tragic cases and jails and what those looked like that brought Mike and I to a place where we were saying, you know, um, what's actually going on here? How can we answer a lot of these kinds of questions that we have in a kind of bigger holistic way. How can we look at this more systemically? Um, in our view, that was like, why don't we just look at the last decade of deaths? Because 10 seems like a nice round number. And I don't, you know, that was a lot. I don't know if we would have come to that conclusion again. Um, but we said, let's re request, you know, 
basically let's look into as many of the deaths that have occurred in Texas jails in the last 10 years as we are able to get records for. And that ended up, ended up being um, you know, 400 and something individual cases that we read the, the Rangers inspection or investigation reports for and logged in this data set. Um, we also were creating that database from scratch. And so that meant we didn't really go into it knowing what the questions we were asking were necessarily. We knew some of the kinds of patterns and red flags that we wanted to track. Um, you know, were there, was this person at suicide risk? Were there kind of signs of deteriorating um, health? You know, did they make an outcry for help? Was that outcry ignored? There were certain things that we had kind of ideas of what we wanted to, to understand better, but the way that we came to those questions was through reading a large volume of the reports. And so a lot of these we had to read multiple times um, in order to kind of get to that point and then you know log them and create this database. Um, and then I think you know some of the, the folks that you see showing up in the story and those kinds of individual cases that we decided to focus more on there, you know, a number of different kinds of considerations that went into narrowing down the specific jails that we wanted to focus on in the specific cases. But there were a lot of, you know, a lot of ones, a lot of calls that were made that didn't make it into the story, right? It's it's kind of a balance of, you know, which you're which are the ones you want and then who can you actually get a hold of what what lawyers are answering their phones or calling us back, you know, what, what families feel comfortable talking about this, um, that kind of thing. So there's always a lot more of those kinds of calls that, that, that you don't see in the final story as well. So it sounds like you're, you're FOIA experts. I assume you say we had to get, when you're trying to get the records, was that all Freedom of Information Act requests? Um, is that, or is it different? Yeah. This, yeah. Any? Yeah, most of the most of these were records. Yeah, um, were for public records requests. That's a. Sorry, I was sorry. struck by the fact that this is a data set or a, a record set that was created in a really great effort for reform, and yet, a it was so hard for you to get a hold of, and b it just documented more problems. <laughs> Um, was really striking going through it. So any any tips on um, a perfect FOIA request to get the record you want, or is that a, a trial and error? Um, yeah, so I mean, I don't I don't know if I'm like, if, if I'm some FOIA master or like open records master, I think, I mean, honestly, I think what was the trick with this request and um, is often the case is just being persistent and you know, knowing the deadlines are, knowing when they have to respond, bugging them when they don't. Um, if you have, if you work somewhere that has a lawyer on retainer or works pro bono, or a lot of places have, a lot of states will have um, freedom uh, of information sort of foundations that, that can even help with the tip line. Those are super helpful in sort of knowing what your rights are. Um, wording wise, I mean, I try to be as like <laughs> broad and specific as possible because I want to get as much as possible, but I don't. Um, want to have like a super long back and forth over what what exactly the records are or, or what they have to produce. So I'll, if they're willing to talk to you, I'll often call the agency to try to get somebody on the phone to make sure I know how those records are kept or what to ask for. Uh, but what's often the case, and it was <laughs> this story for a lot of agencies, is like nobody wants to talk to you. So, um, so yeah, it's a lot of, uh, of follow-up is, is what I would say. So, At what? At what point? Oh, go ahead. Okay. I would just say, like, generally, it's it's helpful to be able to be specific and to narrow your quest and and know what you're looking for. In this case, we were kind of looking for everything, and so I think our requests were like, give us all of the reports that you have for the last ten years. But generally, if you want these kinds of requests to move more quickly, it's helpful to be able to to narrow that down and it wouldn't necessarily take months and months. Um, but yeah, to Mike's point, I think, um, you know, persistence, persistence is key. And it can be really challenging because it, you know, some of the records that we were requesting were from the state jail commission and they were spreadsheets of data that that, that agency had been compiling. And we we genuinely had questions about it. Like we genuinely wanted to know what certain fields meant or 
you know, why they logged things a certain way. And, and even things like that could be pretty difficult to get folks on the phone or to get people to, to answer. Um, and so that can be frustrating. <laughs> Um, I'm noticing some questions popping up in the Q&A, and I want to promise you all we've built time in at the end for ample questions, so keep them coming, but don't think I'm ignoring you. <laughs> we will get to that. Um, I, at what point, I mean, it, so it sounds to me that it was some combination of Mike's lifelong pursuing this information, but also sort of a concentrated, I was trying to do the math, like six to nine months on the records, maybe. At what point where did you know which families you wanted to start contact line? When did you feel like you could start the narrative portion of the reporting? Is it in tandem? Did you feel like you had to know all your patterns and your sort of through line of your story first? I'm curious how, when you're doing a story that depends so much on both, that you make the decision to launch into the next phase? I, th I think we, I think we finished reading the records and logging that data first, right, Mike? Yeah, I mean, it was like I can answer this. One. It was, I mean, it was a, it was a process where, I mean, somewhere in the middle, we had started identifying um, cases, records, reports, where we were like, we, we want to follow up on this. Um, and there were a ton more of those that ended up being in the story. Um, some, some of them, you know, I, we could have written. We could have written a whole feature on uh, or investigated that case that ended up just being a line or a quote from a report in the story. Um, but but yeah, we were still um, we were it was probably somewhere between like towards the let's say last third of the records that we were going through and sort of having a better understanding of what they were showing. Um, running the numbers every once in a while to see what was popping up or looking at what cases we had flagged. Um, I, I just think of like a lot of stories when you're dealing with like a ton of information where it's just this process of whittling. So like we had a, like Sophie said, we were, we were making these huge, you know, requests for, for mountains of records. But um, once we had digested them some and it's also why it was helpful to have two people on the story, we were bouncing questions back and forth to each other a ton. Um, yeah, we had we had like Google Docs full of just of cases, names, things that we wanted to follow up on. And eventually that kind of got whittled down into what we thought were um, the most powerful or I mean, tragic stories that we thought really showed what we were seeing in the records um, writ large. So yeah, we had Sophie? a few different we had kind of a few different, um, I guess, like markers. Or, or columns that we were using of, of tracking as we went, you know, ones that showed kind of different things or raised questions we might wanted to want to come back to or were, you know, particularly striking in a way that we thought was a case that we would want to come back and, and follow up on. And so we were kind of tracking that along the way um, in, in various iterations. And then I think towards the end, you know, we knew that that cases we wanted to really focus in on needed to be the more recent ones because a lot of this was um you know we wanted to kind of get the the longer view of the past 10 years of the ways in which we're seeing the same kinds of patterns happening over and over again but because of the way that um you know the rangers reports come into this and and the sandra bland act kind of aimed to address some of these issues a few years ago we knew that we wanted to focus most on cases that happened since those reforms to kind of see um, how we're still noting that, you know, the same kinds of issues that we were seeing 10 years ago are still occurring in, you know, 2019, 2020. So and I would just add, uh -huh. oh, go ahead. Sorry. no, go ahead. I was just going to say the, 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 the people that ended up being the story too, I, I think it was, um, yeah, a process of us, us determining as we were going through the the records and seeing what stood out and what patterns that was showing that we could you know apply numbers to or sort of articulate a little bit better in our reporting uh yeah what we were going to focus on so i mean uh, so-called natural causes deaths that i think we point to is a pretty dubious distinction when you look at the the, the individual uh, cases and the circumstances in some of them and medical treatment that wasn't given or all those questions that we raised that was obviously something we wanted to we wanted to focus on um, I think mental uh, mental illness, lack of mental health care inside these facilities, uh, it's just a, such a big and enduring and glaring issue. 
um, that still shows up in um, so many of these facilities that we wanted that to be one element. So there was sort of a case that um, that we thought really exemplified that with, with, with Danny, who's mentioned in the story. Um, there are other sort of like, I would say, um, you know, types of cases that we saw that were that were just as just as alarming. But you know, this was we, we only had we only had room for this story uh, in that issue, and so we you know mentioned them in passing, but they we didn't dig into them. Even though whole stories could be written on them, like people um, dying uh, dying from drug overdose inside these facilities, and then how that happens and what red flags were missed. So um, yeah, that process of whittling is really how we ultimately ended up with using that. I think that's one of the hardest things about a big story like this is trying to, you know, let let go of these certain characters and cases that are, like you said, could be whole stories in and of themselves and um, and having to make those choices. Uh, you could teach whole classes <laughs> on how to do that. But I, I want to go back to, I think, a question that we get a lot from our students um, is how do you make that phone call to that family, right? I mean, we're both, you know, as a journalist, I'm in awe um, and just so, you know, grateful that you've got all of these families on the record, but also know that there's um, that there's a lot of skill in um, letting in calling these people, picking up that phone, um, figuring out how to not re-traumatize and respect the source. And uh, as we were talking earlier, you mentioned, um, you know, a lot of a lot of phone, a lot of cold calls. Um, had to be made, and I'm curious how you how you make that call, and how do you introduce yourselves, and how do you get these sources to buy into the story with you? You're smiling, Sophie. Should I take this first? It's hard. It's a good question. It's, it's hard. really yeah. hard. I mean, I think like having two of us, there were a couple times where I had to make a call that I was just kind of, I mean, dreading for the reasons that you're talking about, not wanting to kind of resurface this for someone and. Um, you know, called up Mike and we like chatted through it. And that's another way it's helpful to have kind of a partner on, on this kind of a thing. Um, I don't, I don't think that there's, you know, a, a single answer to that question. I think um, really important is just being upfront with folks about what you're working on and why you think it matters and why their perspective is important. Um, and I think approaching that with, you know, the utmost sensitivity, um, I think, you know, that some of these, you know, I made a call to uh, um, a mother whose son died in a jail more than 10 years ago. Um, and I know, you know, after that happened, she had, you know, spoken out about it some, but it's been 10 years. And so, you know, approaching something like, that in a way that um at that point how much does someone in that position want to talk about it i mean it turned out once i was able to get a hold of her she did and that's great but i think the biggest thing is just clearly explaining your project explaining why you're doing it why it matters um you know why their story matters um how you want to incorporate it being honest and upfront about all those things and just kind of approaching it in a in a way that uh, just remembering they're a person right and like how would you approach any kind of delicate conversation like that with someone um it's hard yeah it's hard um i would echo what sophie said though i mean i think uh like yeah, my my approach, I think the best approach is just to be super open or as, as open as you can with them at first. Like, I feel like a lot of my early conversations um, with people who have already been traumatized by whatever system I'm writing about and I'm, you know, asking in some way for them to, to, to talk to me about it. Uh, yeah, first part of that conversation is usually just explaining the project or the story to them and why, like why, um, why I'm asking them to talk in the first place. Um, oftentimes people are, um, you know, people, I, I don't know, my experience is that people will be, be outraged by what they went through and want to tell somebody about it. And once they sort of either have seen your work before and realize what you do, or, you know, you've, you've convinced them that you'll treat them respectfully by the conversation you've already had, or, um, I mean, 
a lot of people want to talk. Um, but, but I guess the other thing is like, I, I still try to like, uh, make sure I understand what people are comfortable talking about before I get into an interview. And that can be like a quick, com you know, before you turn on your recorder conversation, or that can be like a whole other, you know, talk that you have to have before the interview sometimes. But, um, but I, I do that sometimes, especially if it's going to be going over tough stuff. Um, yeah, just be, being really open, just like Sophie said, remembering <laughs> these aren't like characters in your story. These are real people that um, went through real things and remember why you're doing it in the first place. Um, yeah, I think to keep that in, in mind that, that there's a lot of space. I think I would, oh, I would, also, sorry, no, go ahead. I would, I would also just add, I mean, I think it depends, like different folks we talk to are in kind of very different situations in terms of um, how what happened to a loved one was kind of still present or not in their life. So some of these folks um, were going through litigation at the moment over what had happened to a family member. Um, and so that might be a different conversation because maybe you're I say you, we were going through an attorney, right? And the, the attorney is also on the line and, and that might be a situation where they're more or less willing to talk to a reporter depending on kind of where they are in that process. And that conversation might look a little bit different um, versus, uh, versus other kinds of circumstances. I think another thing, I mean, I, one of my most dreaded calls to make on this story probably was the sister of someone who had uh, died in jail, who was pretty estranged from her brother. Um, and she ended up not taking legal action. Um, and so there was this kind of maybe guilt element involved there. Um, and it was kind of dredging up not only, you know, what had happened to this family member, but also kind of how um, she might be you know, feeling about her, her kind of relationship to him and, and involvement there. Um, but I think, you know, in that circumstance and in others, sometimes we have information about from our reporting about what happened to this person that even a family member doesn't have. And so that can be part of the conversation too, that I think can sometimes make things more sensitive and more difficult, but also I think sometimes is, you know, part of what you're presenting to them as a, as a reason that you want to talk to them. Like, I want to share this information with you too, right? It's, it's kind of a two-way street in a sense. Um, and I found that there were some folks that we spoke to for the story who, you know, through this process of talking to us, I think they were able to kind of better understand what had happened to their loved one. And that was able to kind of give them maybe a little bit of closure too. Uh, um, my next question was actually going to be, what, um, what were the reactions that you had from the families once the story was published? And this, this, the two-part question on that is also all these people that maybe you spent a ton of time with that only did get a line in the story and did, you know, or weren't included at all. And I'm curious how you dealt with those sources, but first, how did the families and the story react? Um, I mean, I can speak like for, I, I remember our, like our Armando who was Danny's dad, um, who I spoke to a lot throughout the process. Um, he, um, I mean, he had already, he already, uh, he, he'd read through this lengthy report of what happened to his son and he'd known about it and there was litigation involved. And he was, I mean, he, he was telling me what happened to his son, right? Like I didn't, I wasn't, this, it wasn't the situation Sophie described, but I think seeing it in context of what, like after um, we had a couple of exchanges after that, and, uh, seeing it, like what happened to his son in context, I think, um, I wouldn't say it made him feel better. I just think it helped, help, help. Um, um, I mean, I think the way that, I think in, in like the way some of these families get treated often is just like really isolating because the, like there, there are these officials. There are these officials that you're supposed to trust and that provide public safety, or you know, and and something awful happens and they can't get any information, or they meet you know incredible resistance, or they're just like not they're not treated well. Um, and so 
to have somebody go over the same stuff with them, but to not treat them that way, I think is, yeah, I think that can be, um, can, can be helpful for, for families processing maybe what happened to them too. So um, I, that's not always, that's of course not always the case, but that I think best case scenario, sometimes that can happen. Um, Sophie, I don't know if you have any thoughts to share. Yeah, kind of similar to that. I think, I think it can be helpful to see it in the context in terms of seeing how many, I mean, it's, it's horrible, but seeing, you know, how common your experience is, right? Like seeing that you're not kind of alone in what you went through um, is really upsetting. But I think like Mike said, a lot of the times this can be pretty isolating or families might feel that they're being ignored. And so seeing other people kind of sharing these kinds of experiences too, I think can be helpful. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know I if I have more to add on reactions. <laughs> I think I got it. Do you reach out to the people that aren't going to be in the story or are only going to be in the story peripherally um, in advance yeah. of the story? How do you handle some of the folks who've spent a lot of time with you? I will say, I mean, I think, um, especially in a, in a story like this one, there weren't a lot of people that we spent a ton of time with that okay. didn't end up going into the story, or at least on the sort of people that were directly impacted by the systems that we're talking about. Um, there might've been some lawyers or there was, yeah, there's probably some, some people that we did interviews with that didn't go in. Um, I think with a story like this, the, the people that are in it and like the degree to which their lives are sort of discussed, um, I, uh, I, I'm usually in like pretty close contact with, with, if I can be, like like Armando, like I just mentioned, I was sort of in contact with him throughout, sort of explaining to him what the story was and also how Danny was gonna, sh how his son was gonna show up in it so that there were just like no surprises at the end. He sort of know, he sort of knew, I mean, he didn't know what the story was gonna be, but he kind of knew what we were doing by the time we just, we had talked over so many different elements of it um, um, at that point. And so I don't think we really, I mean, the goal is to like not, not, not do that with somebody and then have them not show up in the story. I mean, it's, right. it doesn't always, it doesn't always happen, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've had to, I've had, I've either taken people out of stories or I've had editors cut them out of stories before that I really wish would have stayed in there and it's a difficult conversation. But um, uh, I also think it's like part of that like I just said, keeping in contact with people who's, who are mm -hmm. telling you their stories and keeping them informed of what's happening so that like, they shouldn't have to, yeah, they shouldn't have to read the story and be like, what happened? Where did I go? So they already know, they already know that. So, so one thing we didn't mention at the beginning that we should have was that the story was also supported by the Fund for Investigative Journalism. And I wanted you to all to explain that relationship a little bit. I think there's a lot of really interesting work that's happening right now where nonprofit funds like uh, and, and nonprofit groups partner with other nonprofits or journalism insti um, institutions. And so I'm curious uh, what their role was and sort of why and how it works and why you think that's becoming such a necessary part of investigative reporting. Yeah, I, so we, uh, the Texas Observer is a tiny outlet. Um, we don't have a ton of resources. Um, and so, uh, I mean, in this story in particular, the bulk of the, the um, money <laughs> went to records. Uh, that's not always the case, right? Often it's like reporting trips and things like that, um, which there was, you know, some, some went to that too, but really the bulk went to records in this case. Um, I think that kind of application and relationship was largely managed by like editor in chief. Um, but, um, basically we were able to, you know, we, we submitted a proposal and outlined what, um, reporting we'd done so far and records we had so far and kind of where we were hoping to take the story, um, and ended up, uh, getting a grant from them, which allowed us this kind of, um, you know, flexibility of of kind of going after many many records and thinking about different kinds of ways to to present what we were finding and another big um really helpful element of it is that they 
at least the grant that we were awarded, um, the organization paired us with a, they call it a data mentor. Um, and so we were paired with uh, Sarah Cohen, um, who was just super helpful as someone that we could kind of bounce questions off of um, and, you know, chat through some of what we were finding um, and have kind of someone else outside the two of us who had been reading thousands and thousands of pages of police reports uh, to kind of, you know, hear what we were finding and, and kind of offer that like data expert kind of outside uh, perspective. And so that alone was, was really helpful for this story. Yeah, I was curious how you, I didn't know how to ask, how'd you find patterns in all the data, but it sounds like you just answered part of that for me. Um, that's, I'm also been really struck. One of my questions was going to be to talk about how you worked as a team and you've sort of embedded that in a lot of your answers. But I, I think so often the myth of the journalist is like the lone, you know, shoe gum reporter who's out there um, discovering it. And yet we all know that team reporting is a much bigger part of it. Um, I think we're hearing a lot about what the best parts of that were. What were some of the things you had to work through or um, <laughs> share some of your secrets? <laughs> well, honestly, I mean, I wouldn't say, I don't know if there were like any, it, it, this, I mean, it just took a lot of time. I think the, yeah. the, the main stressor with this story was just, I mean, reading through all these, all these reports were, was, was, I mean, punishing. Don't, I mean, um, it, it was just, yeah, wading through a lot of, really difficult cases kind of back to back over over many months uh to try to get a better understanding of what was happening so uh i mean sophie and i had worked on stories before before this one um like feature stories different kinds of investigations and so i think it was like working with somebody you already know you work well with is <laughs> is one is one good thing um yeah sophie i don't know what how did we avoid conflict <laughs> Uh, well, I guess I would say like part of the, part of the kind of, um, origin of this story is related to, to our beats, right? So Mike has been covering, um, mass incarceration and criminal legal system for years and years. And my background is mostly in healthcare reporting. Um, and so I think when we're tackling something that's at the intersection of those two things that really helped and we were able to bring kind of different uh lenses and expertise in in that way and there would be moments you know where i one of us would read something and be like oh my god this is shocking right or or ev everything in this story frankly has been shocking i mean i read it again and i'm shocked again but but that kind of like um having someone I don't want to say on the outside, but someone who's maybe not as steeped in like that specific um, piece of this issue, kind of working on the same thing and being like, yes, this is shocking, um, is helpful. But I also think, you know, when we're talking about cases that involve, you know, medical neglect in a lockup or, you know, someone, um, you know, with diabetes in custody and what lack of treatment looks like, like that's very much an intersection of kind of our two beats. And so being able to kind of bounce that around was, was really helpful. I also think, I guess I'm just saying the positives and you asked for, for conflict. I no, no, I, I'm fine with the positives. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'll, another positive, I guess, is I think like this, and Mike kind of alluded to this, but this was really challenging, not just kind of in the scope of the reporting and the time and and the energy, but um, it was really difficult from like a mental health perspective, like reading reading these hundreds of reports into just awful things happening to people and spending like days at the computer, you know, reading these one after another was really difficult. Um, and so I think, um, you know, having a partner in that as someone that's like, okay, tap out or, you know, let's talk through this or something like that, um, was also very helpful to have. I don't think, I don't know that one person would have been able to, to do that. 
Excellent. I'm, I, I didn't mean to make it sound like I wanted something evil. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think it's always interesting to think about how people create together. I'm going to go to the questions from the audience now. Um, Ellie Eimer says, how do you know the files were accurate? What if the, they wrote a certain person was or wasn't suicidal or, you know, how did you trust that those files? Um, and I think in some cases you were able to find out they weren't accurate, but how did you do that? Yeah, so we um, don't trust them necessarily. <laughs> um, and I think that's kind of part of the point, right? Like we're part of the story is here are all the findings based on what the rangers are reporting, but also here are all these ways that the rangers reports themselves are problematic. Um, and so we have kind of a methodology page that we published also along with a story that explains some of this and kind of our thinking around that. But the kind of caveats are basically like, we assume that everything's really an underestimate in terms of these kinds of findings because any of these things that we're tracking, it's something that, you know, not only did the rangers say they observed, but they also decided to, not only did someone tell them, but they also decided to put it in this report when we're seeing that oftentimes, you know, there's a lot that they're leaving out of these reports, that kind of thing. Um, and so there's definitely caveats that come with the data um, that we kind of outlined in that um, in that methodology, but that's also part of the story, I think here. Um, to the question about a person potentially being suicidal, um, so there were specific things that we were tracking to that question. So it would not be um, generally, you know, do we, we also had to very much remove ourselves. Like it's not our interpretation of what happened. It's like, what does the ranger say? happened and what evidence are they logging for this um and so some of the kind of metrics we were tracking related to suicide was you know did a family member tell the rangers that this person had a history of suicide attempts or did someone in a you know cell near this person hear them talking about um you know considering killing themselves that that kind of thing so specific um, you know, specific red flags that we were, that we were tracking. Yeah, I would just echo what Sophie said. I mean, I think part, part of this, part of what ended up being the story once we, once we really had gone through everything was the, yeah, like she said, the inherent limitations of these reports and how, um, um, when we, when we dug into, you know, individual ones, um, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like a, kind of a, a the iceberg situation and what's actually documented in them. Um, I, you know, I've written about the jail in Fort Worth, it's called Tarrant County here in Texas, and that's jail where there's been a spike in deaths um, and some really traumatic incidents that have made headlines. And you could look at the Rangers investigations, the state police investigations into that facility, and they're pretty perfunctory, even though they cover deaths involving people after they've been like pepper sprayed by guards or tackled or strapped into restraint chairs or um there are situations like that where there are red flags just because of like what little was even documented by a report at a facility that we know has problems but those records don't show much because nobody's forcing them or at least nobody's forcing any sort of like standard reporting or investigations um, into these they, they really sort of run the gamut so yeah that ended up being part of the story actually I'd also just add quickly for, for cases that we focused in more, there was generally supporting documentation that we used. Right. So yeah. we requested autopsy reports from the medical examiner separate from the Rangers reports or, you know, videos of interviews that the Rangers did or things like that also for cases that we were kind of looking at more closely. So Professor Doug Foster, who is one of the screeners on this contest, and I would add one of my uh, supporters as I was uh, running it this year, uh, has this note. He says, thanks for the great work. Can you talk about the impact of the story? What did you hope would happen? What has happened? And what might happen next as a result of this terrific reporting and writing project? I can, I can go. <laughs> um, 
I guess I'll start by saying a, a kind of funny thing about thinking about impact in Texas is that our legislature only meets once every two years. So the legislature has not been in session since the story published. Um, they will be yeah. next 2023. So as far as kind of, um, you know, law, state lawmakers taking action related to this issue, that's a little hard to say at this point. Um, uh, one thing that was important to Mike and I, and I think this is maybe not like a traditional measure of impact, but something that was important to Mike and I was um, we also uh, published, um, you know, part of the spreadsheet that we compiled and other documents that we um, got in our reporting process and that, that we put together um, in the hopes that um, other journalists would be able to use them. Um, we, it's like Mike said earlier, it's way too much for us to be able to, to cover everything. And there's so, so much in those documents. And so our hope is that other reporters are able um, to use those records too. And that has happened. Um, and so that's been um, neat to see. There have been some kind of local reporters who have reached out to us with questions and ended up writing some stories um, related to, to those reports too. Um, do you want to, do you want to take hope? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think Sophie's like spot on with like how we thought about impact a little bit. Like it would be great if the legislature, if the Texas legislature got into session, uh, in 2023 and, uh, you know, bolstered the state regulatory agency here, that's pretty toothless if they did the kind of risk analysis that Sophie and I were attempting to do because one didn't exist. Uh, when we looked for it. Um, I mean, that would be great, but um, like I've been covering like a lot of the Texas legislature, uh, it can be difficult to move reforms through as some people might imagine. And also I've just been reporting, there's, there's so many moving parts here. I think that's kind of what we tried to capture. Um, like I've been reporting on um, conditions in jails here in Texas for a long time. And it's, you know, it's, a lot of different institutional actors and it's pretty intractable, um, um, maybe from sort of like a big picture view, but you know, I've had organizers or journalists in different counties here in Texas ask me about the reports, particular to those jails. And uh, it would be great to see more work and organizing around it, but I think that's a place kind of to start. Um, um, so yeah, that's why we published sort of this, the, the, the data set that we created and have been, um, yeah, giving, <laughs> giving these ranchers reports out to some people to hopefully generate more work around them because there's just, yeah, there's, um, we would be really happy if, yeah, just more stories on, on, uh, jails came out of this. So. so one, uh, person asked, what are your thoughts on the Boston Globe and other publications that are taking out the names of people in their stories who have committed minor crimes? Have you been running into this sort of thing in your own reporting? Um, I can take that. Yeah, I mean, it's something that has come up in different ways kind of throughout throughout my career, I think. Um, how, how, and I, I know my, my practices on this have shifted over time as I think just like the industry in general. Um, like, it's good to see a lot of places not using mugshots anymore, especially for people that are pre-trial. Um, I think a lot of those practices are starting to shift. So, I mean, I, I haven't given a whole lot of thought to or I guess I'm not sure like the right mechanisms for that or how you make those decisions necessarily. But um, I think I saw a paper in the Pacific Northwest, maybe it was SACB, some, some place that was even allowing people to petition to have their names removed after publication after so many times. So I think all that's interesting. I'm not sure the right balance of it, but um, I think in general, this broader trend toward treating people in the criminal legal system with more dignity and respect and understanding how just throwing their name and picture out there can itself compound the trauma, even if you're trying to write about it. But that's a good trend. So, um, yeah. I think that just underscores something for those on the call today who may not have read the story yet. One of the I think one of the most consistently astonishing details at most of these deaths that were documented were people who were pre-trial detainees and had not even been convicted of any alleged crime at that point. Um, so <laughs> just your point there underscored, you know, finding some dignity and honoring that underscores that detail of the story quite 
Well, um, uh, another question and, and one that I was going to ask too is what are you working on now? And I wanted to add a layer on that, which is when you do something this big and this immersive, how do you get started on the next thing? <laughs> Well, I started a whole new job and, and <laughs> decided to help launch a new publication. So I kind of went like one extreme to the other, but uh, um, yeah, so I, I recently took an editing, uh, went back into editing and sort of bounced back and forth between those. Um, so that's been, a, that's been quite a big shift to me. Um, it's been interesting to be on the editor side for some similar stories like uh, at Bolts, we just recently ran a story on um, the sheriff's race out in Oakland, uh, the Alameda County, which that jail and that sheriff have been dealing with a lot of the same sort of systemic issues that we point out in the story. Uh, you could do similar stories like this, I think it would take different forms, but elsewhere. So it's been, uh, that's, that's been the shift for me is, um, yeah, working on more stories like this, but not being in like the driver's seat for them. Um, yeah, I've got some other projects that are kind of related to this a little bit, but, um, yeah, just more more reporting and writing on on mass incarceration and criminal punishment and voting access is kind of what's in the cards for me in the foreseeable future. How about you, Sophie? Um, and I I also left the Observer, and I'm a, a freelance reporter and editor now. Um, and so I um, I've been mostly uh, in in recent weeks and months working on reporting related to reproductive health care access uh, in light of everything that is happening. Um, uh, so that's been kind of my focus recently is, is stories related to that. But um, you know, Mike and I also kind of keep talking about what else we can do with <laughs> some of these, some of these records and um, and what we found with this project. Well, congratulations again. It's um, it's tremendous uh, reporting. I I do want to reiterate um, one of the points you made about that you put the database up online um, so that folks other folks could see it. I, I think it's interesting that one of the points in the story is that Texas theoretically is actually not progressive isn't the right word. What was the um, it's one of the better states for jail reform in terms of what's on the books. So um, I wonder to what degree these records are even available in other states and how someone who's not in Texas might use that database. Yeah. Um, yeah, to your point, there's just uh, the, the, some of the some part, but the story was possible in this form here in Texas where uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily be in other states. Like uh, um, I'm sure anybody from Missouri who's reported there can talk about how difficult it is to get basic information about jails and lockups in that state. Um, so, yeah, a lot of things with uh, like mass incarceration is is kind of it's like this pro it's like this process of like defining the contours of the black box that you're writing about because there's so many un unknowns. Um, um, but but there are yes, I mean you could you could look at you could still look at sort of what we compiled and um, I think look at what trends we identified and probably find other ways to track them, even if you're just looking at medical examiner records or whatever's available in your state. So I think there's, uh, yeah, hopefully in, in states where, where you don't even have, you know, this degree of oversight where things are basically just tracked, um, you can, there's still a lot of inroads. Well, good. Thank you. Uh, this is inspiring to all of us. And thank you for your work. And thank you for your time today. Congratulations again on the John Bartlett Martin Award. We're uh, excited to have you be a part of our fold. Have a good one. Thank you so much.